temperatures rising to the high teens. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel... 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Big news, big debates, big opinion. Patrick Christie's Tonight is the week's biggest show. Every weekday, 9 to 11 p.m., we've got the inside track on the day's top stories. There'll be sharp takes you won't get anywhere else. We will set the news agenda, not just follow it, and I want to bring you along for the ride. Whatever it is, we'll have our finger on the pulse. It's news, but it's this close to entertainment. Patrick Christie's Tonight, 9 to 11 p.m., only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. Hello, good evening. It's me, Jacob Rees-Mogg, on State of the Nation tonight. The European Court of Human Rights has ruled that human rights can be violated by not acting to prevent climate change. This is an extraordinary power grab, turning a court into a politically motivated legislative. We must leave urgently, otherwise we can expect human rights violations for not building enough wind turbines or solar panels. As the Vatican declares transgender surgery should never be attempted as it interferes with the will of God, leaked documents from the Cass Review have suggested young people who believe they are trans may be suffering from mental health problems. But can we be surprised by that? The Foreign Secretary, Lord Cameron, has met the former US President Donald Trump at his Florida resort, as my fellow GB News presenter Nigel Farage suggests he could be the link between a Starmer Trump leadership. But did you see Mr. Trump's latest eclipsing new campaign video? Plus, this year's town hall rich list has been revealed with more than 3,000 councillors earning more than £100,000 of your money, all at a time of council tax hikes and record-breaking debt bills. Is it time to abolish some of these councils altogether? State of the Nation starts now. I'll be joined this evening by my most perspicacious panel, broadcast journalist Judita De Silva and associate commentator at The Telegraph, Mutaz Ahmed. 
As always, I want to hear from you. It's a crucial part of the programme. Email me, mailmog at gbnews.com. But now it's your favourite time of the day. It's the news from Polly Middlehurst. Jacob, thank you and good evening to you. Well, the top story from the GB Newsroom tonight is that the MP William Ragg has resigned from the Conservative Party after admitting he gave his colleagues phone numbers and details to a suspected scammer. He'll now sit as an independent MP in the House of Commons. Last night, he resigned from two positions on parliamentary committees. William Ragg has claimed he was manipulated into sharing other politicians' personal details as part of a Westminster sexting scam. He has since apologised, saying he was mortified, and that prompted the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, to call him courageous for coming forward. Arsenal Football Club are currently hosting Bayern Munich at the Emirates Stadium tonight despite a terror threat from the Islamic State group. That game has just kicked off. Manchester City are also in action tonight. They're away to Real Madrid. Here, the Metropolitan Police says it has a robust policing plan in place for tonight's game in London and European football's governing body has insisted that all of this week's Champions League quarterfinals will go ahead as planned despite that terror threat. Islamic State claimed responsibility, you may remember, for the last attack in Moscow a month or so ago, resulting in the deaths of more than 140 people. The Foreign Secretary said today it's in the interests of US security that President Putin fails in his illegal invasion of Ukraine. Lord Cameron also reiterated the UK's support for Ukraine in their with war with Russia and urged American politicians to release billions of dollars of extra funding to boost the military there, warning that failing to do so would put Western security at itself at risk. Speaking in Washington after a meeting with the US Secretary of State, he said continued support for Ukraine is vital. Put simply, we know what works. We know what they need and we know what is right for us. In terms of what works, we know that if we give the Ukrainians the support they deserve, they can win this war, they can achieve the just peace that they deserve. They've sunk 25% of Russia's Black Sea fleet. They've inflicted over 350,000 casualties on uh, Russian armed forces who launched this unprovoked and unjustified um, aggression. And we know that if we keep on backing them, we can lead this to the right conclusion. Lord Cameron speaking earlier on today. Well, lastly, Labour is set to announce a new crackdown on tax avoiders today in a bid to help fund the NHS, they say. The Shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeves, will pledge to raise over £5 billion a year, which Labour would use to tackle, they say, NHS waiting lists and fund free school breakfast clubs. The party has said it will also raise £2.5 billion over the next parliament by closing loopholes in the government's plans to abolish exemptions for non-DOMs. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen right now or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights states that everyone has the right to respect for his private and family life, his home and his correspondence. There's nothing objectionable in this. The idea that your property and your life is sacrosanct is an ancient British concept. The Magna Carta makes it clear when it says, no free man shall be taken or imprisoned or dispossessed or outlawed, exiled or in any way destroyed, nor will we go upon him, nor will we send against him, except by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. Pitt the Elder said it when he declaimed, in one of my favourite quotations, the poorest man may in his cottage bid defiance to all the forces of the crown. It may be frail, its roof may shake, the wind may blow through it, the storm may enter, the rain may enter, but the King of England cannot enter. All his force dares not cross the threshold of the ruined tenement. Both in the 13th century and in the 18th century, the British knew and understood they had rights, and the courts have upheld them when agents of the state have overreached. Unfortunately, the European Court of Human Rights is a political construct that believes itself to be above the law. So, in this case, a group of elderly Swiss women made a claim that their human rights were being violated by the Swiss government because older people are supposedly more vulnerable to the consequences of climate change. 
and that the government wasn't living up to its climate policy ambitions. The judgment argues that the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 8, quote, encompasses a right to effective protection by the state authorities from the serious adverse effects of climate change on lives, health, well-being and quality of life. The judgment went on to say that the Swiss Confederation had failed to comply with its duties, positive obligations, under the Convention concerning climate change. There had been critical gaps in the process of putting in place the relevant domestic regulatory framework, including a failure by the Swiss authorities to quantify, through a carbon budget or otherwise, national greenhouse gas emissions limitations. In other words, not pursuing green zealotry through fanatical policies such as carbon budgets is tantamount to breaching the human rights of your citizens. The ECHR has officially opened up an entirely novel view of rights. There are reportedly other cases across many of the signatories to the Convention, which means the 46 members are vulnerable to these sorts of rulings too. And this is a fundamental problem with the court. Article 8 says nothing about climate change or green policies, but because the court, the court itself, has decided to guide itself by the living instrument doctrine, it has extended Article 8 to cover green issues. The idea of a living instrument is that the court can develop the convention by recognising new rights, although they were never envisaged in the original document. This doctrine puts the court above the nation-states who agreed to it or any form of democratic control. It becomes effectively a legislative rather than a judicial arm of government. It is inventing, creating law rather than interpreting law. In other words, the court can make up any old rights it feels like. And this is guided by its own political ideology, one of which turns out to be green fanaticism. In this way, the court makes a mockery of rights because it removes that fundamental democratic right of voters to change the law under which they live. That's why it is now time to leave. Our rights have always come from Parliament, not from unelected judges in Strasbourg who make up the law as they go along. As Lord Sumption said, we are more than capable of setting up our own updated Bill of Rights in our own domestic legislation if there were a democratic mandate for it. And that's the point. It's about democracy. Our rights must have a democratic mandate. There is no mandate for the right to live in an eco-fantastic dystopia, which is why we should leave the court. As ever, let me know your thoughts, mailmog at gbnews.com. But I'm joined now, I'm very pleased to be joined now, by Geoffrey Robertson, KC. Um, thank you very much for joining me. The court Good evening, seems to Jacob. have taken... Good evening, <laughs> nice to see you. It's, it's quite a leap by the court into further evolution of positive rights rather than negative Have rights. you read its judgment, Jacob? You've pulminated for five minutes. Have you read the judgment? I haven't read the full judgment, Be no. honest. Be no, no, I haven't read the full read judgment. The judgment at all. I've it's read the so reports of the judgment in detail. You would take two days to read it. So let me tell you what it says, if I may. It says... And this was, you talk about a political construct, this was a court constructed by Winston Churchill and his government, his conservative government. Back yes, in yes, I know that. I, I'm well aware of that, as are all my good. viewers. Well, let's... So it was not a political construct. And this is uh, simply a judgment that has taken further the right of individuals to have a government that protects their health. Now, we know governments in the past have been held liable to protect them against murder by police, against torture. And this simply takes the right of private life further by saying it also requires the government to protect individuals against the lack of health that comes from scientifically established threats and this but Jeff, Jeffrey, this is this is, is quite long... a this is quite a leap to go from saying that we agreed to outlaw torture to saying that we agreed a, a selection of positive rights and it's inconceivable that the lord chancellor at the time no, it's not who was instrumental in this would, would have been would have been thinking about a living document it's the living document doctrine that is the court absorbing well, of power it's a to itself document because 
because life progresses. We have more information. We have a better sense of decency. We don't hang people as we used to. No, but so, we don't but hang people. Oh, but the, Jeffrey, that's a brilliant point because we don't hang people because Parliament changed the law to stop us hanging people. The usual run of British law is that if it's out of date, Parliament updates it, whereas these judges have taken it upon themselves without any mandate no, to change is, the law. You, you're quite wrong. Parliament, <laughs> judges are doing what judges are meant to do. That is holding politicians accountable for their promises to their people. One, no, they don't. Judges on. don't hold... They, they, hold they, they, on, they, hold they, on, they, Jeffrey. You know that's not right. Judges do not, not hold politicians accountable for their I'm promises. Judge, so I know. I will, but you've just said something very judges, important. Judges interpret the law. They don't hold politicians accountable. We're held accountable by our voters. No, judges hold politicians accountable when they lie to their people. The Swiss government promised to get to net zero by 2050, and then it did nothing about it. It didn't produce any kind of policy that was rationally capable of doing that. And all the court said was that it should do that as it promised. It did. Judges don't legislate. They don't make the law they decide whether the law has been broken. And in this case, and in any other case, where nations ignore climate change and nations expose their people to ill health or to the scientific certainty of ill health, then the courts can simply say, you're breaching your obligation to look after your own people. That's all. They're not saying how they should do it. They're saying you're just breaching it. And that was no, the they're, they're, they're saying They're, they're not saying that the Swiss should follow Swiss law. They're saying they know better than the Swiss government that is accountable to the Swiss voters. But thank no, you very much, Jeffrey. Oh, thank you. I've <laughs> got to move on now, because with me now is a great friend of the programme, director of the Climate Media Coalition, Donica McCarthy. Donica, as always, thank you for coming in. Um, I know you will be in favour of this judgment, but is it right that this is made by the courts rather than politicians? Well, you say that the, the court today went beyond its remit. Actually, the European Convention on Human Rights was based partially on the original Bill of Rights set up in ancient British history. And secondly, it was actually committed to protecting the lives, the homes and the health of the population. And so therefore, I would argue today's judgment goes to the core of what the Convention was about, which is protecting life, protecting health and protecting people's homes. And you referred in your, in, in your monologue to that uh, cottager having his home invaded by the elements. Does not the cottager have the right to have its government protected well, from the elements destroying no, no. its home and flooding it I mean, this, with rising sea levels? But this is levels. a fundamental difference about negative rights and positive rights. Now, I'm quite clear that there are negative rights, that the government may not invade your property, but there are not this set of positive rights that have been created by the court. Those are matters for Parliament to legislate on as to whether you have a welfare system, whether you aim for net zero. Those are completely political issues, not the responsibility of the court. The court is there to protect negative rights. You won't be tortured, that you won't have unreasonable searches, that you won't be, um, you won't be held... Hung. You won't be hung. Well, that was a decision made by Parliament. Yeah, that's um, what it's made by the... But it, it applies to every single nation yeah, in the we, Council we of made Europe. it before the court opined on well, that. It applies to all of the uh, signatories of the Convention. But now. we'd made it before that. It was that's, made by uh, Parliament positive. to well, abolish... Agreed. And the Bill of Rights as, as was created before the Convention of Human Rights. And the Convention of Human Rights, with Church's inspiration, uh, 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 applied it to all of Europe after the World War. And I think the court, the court point here... Yeah, but the Churchill uh, the thing... point is the right to life, the right to home and the right to health. And climate, if the courts can't intervene when the state is failing on the biggest threat, I would argue, the science argues, and this morning's news no, that we have the, done above 1.6, is... if, the, if the courts can't intervene on the greatest threat to life in human history, what is the point But, but this it? is completely speculative. It's not speculative. It is, it is because we what? know that um, cold kills more people each year than heat. So what the court is saying 
is that actually the climate getting hotter will be more dangerous than it not. They don't know that. Well, no, the you whole... don't know that. Well, of course because we do. all the evidence so far Did is not... that a slightly warmer climate actually not, keeps more people it's not, alive. It's not slightly warmer. It's 1.6 degrees. Yep. That is, implies that, the, that all but of we the... Know, we know that The implications people... of that threaten but you're the, not going the to rainforest, tra... it threatens the, um, the, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the barrier reef. But, but we know... If those, uh, if those we know that the barrier reef, we've just people, read about this, is stronger than ever. Mil no, it's not. It's just bleached for the sixth time in seven years. And the scientists say once it goes above 1.5 degrees, which it went last year, in Jacob. Yeah, and what happened last year? We're all fine. No, we're, we're still not alive. all fine. L listen to the farmers in Britain. The, the same rainfall as we had in 1872 the, 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 or whenever it was. It was 200% above the average, the highest yep, ever. Is, and there are farmers, uh, there are farmers of, today... We've had high levels of rainfall. No, this, this is the highest on record. History. Highest on record. But if you take 18 months, if you and take one year, it's the it. same as some day in the 1870s. Hi highest, no, highest ever. In, in, in human history was the rainfall in Britain this year. Not and there are farmers, in human history, because you the, simply don't there know. There are farmers... But Donica, there are farmers, hold on, finish, hold on, because that's a fundamental food fallacy. Food is really important. You say the highest ever in human history. We so, don't know that, in because recorded, we don't have records going back corrected. more than 150 years. I stand corrected. In recorded human history, Which is very highest. short. It is very short, but in terms of temperature, it goes back in scientific uh, studies to 125,000 years. That was the hottest year in that le length of time. So beyond recorded history, and we're but all in fine. scientific... We're not all fine. But we haven't all died. There, there are record rainfalls. There so, are record so what's this court doing? It's saying if the temperature goes up, we'll die. And the temperature's gone up, the, they're the, all alive. The, the, World Health Organization, the World Health Organization has very clearly stated... Yeah, but that, that's, they're the ones who... Um, who that if we go above 1.5 degrees... Wouldn't investigate Wuhan. Look, look I wouldn't take the World Health the problem, Organization too seriously. The problem with having any debate no, with you, Matt, Jacob, bunch. is that there is no body of expertise, international or national, that you seem so to accept. It's a political and, uh, matter and for don't, governments if to you decide, don't accept, not judges. If you don't accept what the international experts say, then I would say judge what the international oil company scientists say. And they said I'd, this is a threat to our future and the courts should have intervened. I trust the people, I trust the voters, not self-appointed, self-perpetuating uh, judges. Anyway, thank you, Donald. It is great fun having you on. Coming up, some text has been leaked from the upcoming Cass Review, which speculates on the causes of transgenderism. And it's not necessarily good news for the gender activists. And don't forget, I'll be talking to one of the people behind the latest revelations of Council Fat Cats making six figures from your taxes. Britain's Newsroom. Weekday mornings from 9.30. Is it OK to call people fat? I won't call Bev fat because she isn't. She <laughs> won't call me fat because I'm not. But the fitness fanatic, Derek Evans, you might know him better, is 90s icon, Mr Motivator, recently he's told a podcast, diabetes have gone through the roof. You should be able to call people fat. Well, he joins us now. Good morning, Derek. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you. So I think what you're getting you. at is this idea that we've become so polite about weight that we're ignoring the elephant in the room. Um, if you'll forgive the <laughs> forgive the phraseology there, and actually sure. sometimes you've got to be cruel to be kind. Well, actually, you know, this has been taken out of all context. I actually didn't say you're entitled to call people fat. What I did say is that in the 80s and 90s, I remember the way I got into television, there was a gentleman walking at reception while I was waiting for the people I was training. And for some reason, I got up and I prodded him in the belly. And I said to him, you need to deal with that. That was fat. We have a nation where obesity, diabetes is killing every one of us. Mm. And unless we take responsibility for our health, rather than waiting for government to do this, government to do that, it is our responsibility, right, to look after our independence and our health. And as we get older, it's even more critical, right? And that's why I'm here as an example saying to you, listen, I'm 71 years of age and movement is medicine. And you can't sit around watching television and not going out to the gym or wherever, you will never ever be able to look after your family and everything you've worked for, you will lose it. I've never seen a hearse, uh, sorry, a deposit account behind a hearse. Mm. I've ne no matter what you work for, the most important thing you can do with your life is every hour, do something active. 
every hour. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Well, we were talking about the brouhaha around the ECHR and climate change, and lots of mail mogs have zoomed in. Al says what some foreign court wants is a matter for them, not in our interest about it. Sonia, you are spot on. I like mail mogs that begin by saying things like you are spot on. There is climate change. It's been happening for years. The Romans were growing grapes in Northumbria. Peter, leave the ECHR now. And David... Why don't they consider the hardship and danger caused by costs which have increased for fuel and food caused by blind drives to net zero? Now, after five years of detailed consideration, the Vatican has released a 20-page document entitled Infinite Dignity, outlining the Church's views on transgender surgery. The declaration is unambiguous. Surgery to change one's biological sex is not to be attempted. Any attempt is viewed as a serious risk to the dignity of the person. It quotes St. Benedict in its text and says that human dignity is, quote, a fundamental principle which faith in the crucified and risen Jesus Christ has always defended, especially when in respect of the simplest and most defenceless people it is disregarded. The opinion has been echoed by other bodies, spiritual or secular. A major review into transgender children by a leading paediatrician is to warn that children who think they are transgender may in fact be facing mental health problems Rather than beginning the process of surgical transition, children instead advised to undergo counselling. Well, I'm joined now by Joanne Lockwood, founder of Sea Change Happen, a diversity consultancy. Um, Joanne, thank you very much for, for joining me. Isn't this very important with relation to children, that the first response should be counselling rather than assuming that they have made this potentially life-changing decision? Thank you, Jacob, and uh, I appreciate the, the Vatican jumping in on this discussion as well. So, yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree that we, can, we need to do right by our young people, our children, by ensuring the services are there to support them. And that includes a multifaceted approach, including counselling, including support for parents, including support for teachers and people who look after young people. And that's where I think they've been let down over the last five to ten years where resources have not been provided to adequately support young people through counselling, through uh, their gender identity, through the conf conflicts they face on a daily basis. So I think, yes, counselling is critically important in looking after our young people, but that's not to say that affirming their gender identity, affirming their, their concerns, shouldn't also be considered but in, in partnership with, with counselling and support. But isn't that quite risky with people at such an early stage in their lives uh, who may find that this isn't actually what they really want to do and there's the risk of taking steps that are quite hard to reverse uh, if you act too quickly? It's, it's certainly risky if the medical professionals, the, the counsellors, are not available to support those people through that journey. Uh, many people successfully and have successfully gender transitioned at a young age but for decades and decades, this is not a new thing. What is a new thing is that the, the medical professionals, the healthcare professionals are not funded well enough to be able to keep up the demand that seems to scare people. But is it all about funding? Because the numbers do seem to have risen recently and it's hard to understand why that should have happened except for there's been an element of propagandising about it to try and encourage people uh, to decide their own gender, which may not be the best thing for children to do? Um, 
I, I don't think there's a societal pressure to persuade people to change their gender. Uh, it's become socially less stigmatized. And I say less, not not removing the stigma. You know, in the same way we, we talked about in the 70s and 80s about people being gay, people were worried about people catching gayness or inheriting it or discovering because they could be gay, they would be gay. I think we, we've been through that lesson of Section 28 and the history of that. And there's still this perception that being transgender, being trans, being non-binary, in some way you're broken and, and need to be prevented by from breaking yourself. Affirming people's gender identity can be immensely validating and immensely relieving the, the mental health pressures that they've felt for all of their lives. So, yeah, there's, there's plenty of track record here where many young people have successfully transitioned in the past and continue to do so with the right, right. support. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Joanne. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, with me now is my panel, broadcast journalist Judita De Silva and associate common editor at The Telegraph, Mutaz Ahmed. Um, Judita, this is obviously a very sensitive issue, but the issue Joanne raises is about affirming. And I wonder whether that is the right thing to do with children or whether actually they need to have clear counselling first to see what the real position is. Um, I think that the... It, when you're dealing with the group that's marginalized and has a sentiment that being living their true being their true self is something that they've had to fight to get there's a set, there's a hypersensitivity when it comes to any discussion around the topic but i do see that if you're more pragmatic in your understanding of what this is endeavoring to do it's saying that if you have a child that says i do not believe that i'm in the body i should be in the first question could be why. What made you feel this was the remedy to whatever mental state you are existing in? And when you have the, when you pursue the, um, the question why, you begin to understand the stimuli they've been exposed to that led them on a path to feeling this was the only remedy or the best remedy they believe they have. So it's not saying it's anything anti-trans. It's saying that the road to making a decision that fundamentally challenges the biological building blocks of human existence is of such gravity it cannot be put in the hands of a child. And, and that's a very fair point, isn't it, Mithas, that you want to um, question what is happening, whether there's outside societal pressure. I thought Joanne's point comparing it with um, homosexuality in the 1970s is, is an important one, that people have been very nervous about discussing this yeah. because of the history around discussions of sexuality I previously. Think, I think there's more, you know, we should be frank here. If I had said two years ago that these children identifying as trans had mental health issues, uh, I would have been thrown out, I would have been called disablest and transphobic, and it turns out now, if the reports are correct, that quite a lot of them have serious mental health issues, quite a lot of them are neurodiverse, quite a lot of them, I think other research has shown, have autism and so on. And this is, it looks as if it is an outlet, right? And some people have argued there is an element of social contagion, right? And there is an element of trendiness and so on. And the problem I have with the affirmative approach is we're talking about children here. Aff affirmation is promotion often and, for children. And that's really important that <clears throat> um, I think Mithai's point that two years ago, the um, floodgates would have opened, and that J.K. Rowling played a very important role in allowing people to discuss this in a more rational way and say, do children need counselling? Are there underlying causes that are not just about gender but relate to neurodiversity, um, autism and so on? I think when it comes to the word of affirmation, it comes to the, how it's applied. Because when a child presents with a problem this profound, that dogmatic parental approach might be counterproductive. It's a question of recognising that there is an issue that they're battling with, that they feel this is the remedy. So you have to approach have a discursive approach with the child where they feel, as Joanne said, I'm in an environment where I don't feel I will be judged or made to feel that they're made to feel that there is something wrong with me. I present with an issue that could have a myriad 
of remedies to it. And I'm by having a conversation that makes me feel comfortable enough to be open, I may get to a final conclusion where I feel this is not the way I have to go. But when you immediately approach it where they feel I have to be combative to hold my position, that is where that word of affirmation comes in, means recognize the person who has this issue and treat them in such a way that they feel they're being included in the process to finding a solution. Isn't such an extreme change bound to indicate unhappiness, though, to some extent? It does indicate a level of unhappiness because you're saying who you are is not who you feel you should be, definitely. But then at the same time, it's also... I, I say, like, for instance, like the when she brought up the issue about being gay, if you are, you are. It's a question you're now dancing between nature and nurture. There are certain things, there are certain people that are not, that just are not conventional and you have to recognise that. OK, well, thank you very much, my panel. Coming up next, the noble Lord Cameron met former US President Donald Trump today. But did you see his gloriously self-parodying campaign video? Plus, can you guess how many local councillors are earning... They're not local councillors, local council employees are earning six figures as they increase your council taxes. Hello, good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it's going to be a dry and clear night for most of us across the UK. There's a chance of frost tomorrow, but it will also be a fairly bright start. That's as this ridge of high pressure is moving in for this evening. It's a brief settled interlude between weather systems, so there will be more rain to come on Wednesday. But for the time being, it's going to be a dry night and a clear night. So plenty of starry skies, and that's going to allow temperatures to fall away much more quickly than they have done of late. So it's going to be a colder start tomorrow with, with a risk of frost across eastern areas of Scotland, northeast England as well. But everywhere is going to be on the chillier side to start the day away from the far west where we'll see the rain move in quite quickly tomorrow morning. So Northern Ireland seeing the heaviest rain first thing but also cloudy skies and some fairly persistent rain across parts of Wales, the southwest but it's into Scotland, western Scotland in particular where the rain will turn quite persistent through the day as well as parts of the Lake District we could see 60 millimetres of rain falling through the day but it is going to be a warmer day so that cloud and rain is bringing with it milder air that stays with us for Thursday as well. And on Thursdays, uh, there is a chance of seeing some brighter spells, particularly across northern and eastern areas of the country. Across the south, we're more likely to see some drizzly rain come and go through the day. Friday, once again, looks like it should stay dry across southern areas with more rain moving into the north and temperatures rising to the high teens. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my God, argument so... for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Well, um, we've been discussing the Vatican and trans issues, and you've been sending in your mail mogs, but actually on the previous section, because Jeanette says, does Sunak have the backbone to leave the ECHR? Please don't let us have a Labour government. Here, here, Jeanette. And Elizabeth says, dear Sir Jacob, the science underpinning carbon and climate change is rigged as it's based on modelling. Well, we all know that modelling in economic circumstances is hopeless. So before we get into the diplomatic details of Lord Cameron's visit to Donald Trump's Florida resort earlier today, there was a certain campaign video I wanted to show you. 
The former president is known for his online presence, which perhaps reached its peak back in 2017 when he tweeted the words, despite the negative press, coffee. It sparked a national debate as to the meaning of the word, a, a word you don't find in Dr Johnson's dictionary, as far as I'm aware, and whether he meant to type it intentionally or not. But in light of last night's solar eclipse, Donald Trump's social media team may have surpassed the previous high of coffee. Well, I think it's absolutely brilliant. I'd love to see David Cameron replace Donald Trump's face in that final picture as the silhouette against the sun. But on to slightly more serious matters, away from coffee and solar eclipses, Lord Cameron met the former US president earlier today. It's the first time a senior government minister has met Trump since he left office back in 2021. And it comes at a crucial time, months away from the US presidential election, while support for the war in Ukraine begins to lag among US Republicans and the Ukrainian counteroffensive against the Russians isn't going as we might like it. There are fears on both sides of the Atlantic that a second Trump presidency would leave Ukraine isolated and NATO unsupported, increasing Europe's vulnerability. While my panel is still with me, Judita De Silva and Mutaz Ahmed. Mutaz, this is very important, isn't it? Because David Cameron said some pretty fruity things about Donald Trump in the past. Yes, he called him a fool and stupid and so on. And Donald Trump remembers these things. He doesn't forget. Um, it might be argued that the trip was counterproductive uh, because it would have angered and reminded the megalot that this man was against Trump. He's now for Ukraine. And the way they triangulate things, that means Ukraine is also bad and they should go on blocking this funding. Um, but the, the realistic, the, the, you know, in the, in the real world, Trump, I think a lot of people are realising, is likely to win um, and Ukraine may soon run out of artillery and then of funds, and Trump would be more likely to negotiate uh, with Russia claiming territory in Europe, and that undermines all our sovereignty. So I think it's getting pretty desperate now, um, uh, but it's come a bit late. Uh, it, it's, it's the reality of politics, isn't it, that one minute you're rude about somebody and next minute you're in coalition with them, as David Cameron found with Nick Clegg all those years ago, and that grown-up politicians deal with that, usually Donald Trump has historically been quite sensitive, so this must have made it a quite awkward first meeting. Um, I, awkward on the surface, but I think what you're looking at now is a very different Trump. It's a more seasoned Trump. And also he'll realise that based on the tests he's, he's withstood the past few years, he's got a different, a more holistic perspective of what, what the challenges are and would be. When it comes to Cameron, he is one of the most seasoned diplomats that UK has. No matter what has gone on before, he can always see the bigger picture, whether you like him or not. Even the rhetoric around him being the architect of Brexit, people recognise the value he holds as a politician. And him going forward, despite what has gone before, is a, a show of pragmatism. Whether Trump is in or not, a, relation, a diplomatic relationship must be sustained with whoever goes into power. And learning the lessons from 2016, where everyone put their bets on Clinton, and then you had no relationships with a Trump administration, you cannot make the same mistake twice. See, he's seasoned, but he's jarring. There is something wrong with David Cameron's tone, which is that the US must provide these funds. The US has to back Ukraine. The US is a big country of its own interests. And to be honest, they don't really care who Lord Cameron is or what he does. Um, and the, the mainstream Republicans in America back this bill, they want it to go through. The problem is the MAGA Republicans, who already dislike David Cameron, I don't understand the logic in sending the man they really dislike 
to convince them. It's the optics of eating humble pie because he's showing that I am willing to do what needs to be done for something I am sh I'm saying is a greater good. He's showing but optically the importance of Ukraine, that it's greater than the humiliation of having to go cap in hand to a man that you are so derogatory about. And that's a good point because he's gone to pay homage to the Trump resort in Florida. He's not having a meeting with Trump in Washington when he's having other meetings. This is very much um, a suppliant going to see somebody he wants something from. Something very similar was attempted uh, with when Boris Johnson was foreign secretary with the Iran nuclear deal. He flew over there, he met Trump uh, with other foreign secretaries. They literally begged him to stay in and it didn't work. But Trump was right on that. It was a terrible deal he, and it was a very good thing that Trump pulled out of it. I, I agree with you. The Iran deal was terrible and he was right on that. He thinks he's right on this, which is that Ukraine isn't, you know, Russia isn't an immediate threat to America's sovereignty, but, whereas China is. But and they does he really elsewhere. think that? Or does he just want to try and use leverage to get... Um, NATO to up its spending, which he's been successful in so far. I mean, one of the things that happened since he first attacked NATO is that NATO states have increased their expenditure. Indeed, because what one thing you ha you must, whether you like him or not, give Trump credit for is that he does know how to shake the system seismically enough that it forces people to one, pay attention and two, take action. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, like they say, a broken clock is right twice a day. Sometimes his very rebellious actions can move in a positive direction when it comes to the action of a collective. That is what happened when it comes to NATO spending on defence. And again, when it comes to what um, David Cameron has done, I really do applaud it because he understands, again, the language of politics. You're dealing with a man with an ego, with an axe to grind. Doing, going to Mar-a-Lago, beating him on his turf, you're showing that I'm willing to humble myself on your, on your say-so in order to get to a point where there is a dialogue between us. OK, am I reading too much into that little election clip, which I thought showed a very different Donald Trump, a Donald Trump who's willing to laugh at himself which I never thought I would ever see. And I thought that showed a Donald Trump who's actually much more businesslike. He's, he's a bit more like that on the campaign trail. Um, so I had to watch quite a few of his speeches. And he does make jokes about himself much more often now. He is more relaxed. I think there's a sense of he's so up against the wall that he... He stopped caring, basically. No, I see, and, I see and, ego. And That's the... Trump saying that I have the power and appeal to eclipse the sun. That is, so? e that is ego. I think he's laughing at himself. That's 24 karat Trump. Anyway, thank you to my panel. Coming up next, finally, we'll be showing you how your money is being wasted on fat cat council employee salaries. Plus, how do you feel about the abolition of vowels, particularly if you live in Aberdeen? Monday to Thursday from 7 p.m. Good evening. Well, I thought it was an absolutely knockout front page of a sun that went online last night and was on display all over the country today. Union joke, and there is. Well, you can just about make out that it's the Union flag, better known perhaps as the Union Jack, but they've decided to add pink and all sorts of colours to it, and that is on sale uh, for fans going to the Olympics in France this year to buy and to wear, which led to a great big panic. What on earth would be on the shirts, shorts and kit of the athletes? Well, a statement did come out mid-morning from the British Olympic Association, which said all Team GB athletes will wear the Union Jack as normal in Paris. However, Team GB kit itself is expected to include different shades of blue or red as in previous years. Well, I'm sorry, I don't really buy that. Now, we sent Adam Cherry out to Wembley today to ask some members of the public how they felt about this. This episode of Companies Fixing Things That Weren't Broken. We're going to be asking the people of London what they think of the changing colours of the Team GB Olympic logo. Take a look at this. The blue, the red and the, the white, it's perfect, I feel like. You know, it shouldn't be that controversial, but, you know, it's iconic. I feel like the, yeah. the, the colours are iconic. Everyone's known London for being, you know, red, white and blue. I feel like it doesn't really represent England like that. Yeah, the, yeah. the colours of the... Like the colours are kind of random. I, I think it's very colourful. Mm. It's very uh, pinkish and quite unicornish kind of thing, yeah. A bit too unicornish for Team GB. A little bit. Disgusting. Well, we're British. Their colours are not pink and what purple and... 
Uh, like, you know, some patterns on there. Yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. going crazy. That's, that's not our flag. Yeah. That don't represent me. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Well, welcome back. In an age characterised by chronic mismanagement at a local government level, one might expect a little contrition from local authorities, perhaps in the form of reduced salaries to council chief executives or more transparency in the way money is spent. Yet, extraordinary though it may seem, councils still persist in paying bloated salaries to unelected officials. Over 3,000 council workers earned six figures of vastly wasteful exercise, but Hampshire Council stands on the podium. Even though it's warned that it faces bankruptcy, it has a Director of Culture, Community and Business Services who was paid a total of £651,158 in one year, nearly five times more than the Prime Minister. So how do they find the cash to sustain these handouts? Well, from you, of course, council tax continues to rise as local leaders seek to raise money from the people with all the zeal of King John. The first time some households are having to pay over £5,000 a year, which would have been a fifth of the total exchequer revenue under the not lamented King John. As councils reach breaking point, perhaps we need a modern day Magna Carta to keep in check such arbitrary practices. Well, I'm joined now by Elliot Keck, the head of campaigns at the Taxpayers Alliance, the think tank behind these revelations. Um, thank you for coming in. Every year, this gives you uh, a fantastic report to point out the extravagance of councils which are going bankrupt. How do they justify it? Well, you picked up on a, a few things which is really interesting. Firstly, we haven't had the Magna Carta mentioned today in the context of the Town Hall Riches. And there's a couple of other things you mentioned. Firstly, the increase in the number of people on, on high salaries and high remuneration packages, despite the fact that we've seen inflation busting council tax hikes, and also the importance of transparency. And actually, this year, we've, we've actually meet, reached a sad milestone where, for the first time, over 50 councils have failed to publish their accounts, 59 councils in total. And that's really, really troubling. That means you know, almost about um, a sixth of councils have failed to publish the key document that shows taxpayers and residents how they're spending their money and what they're spending it. So does that on. mean there may be more than the 3,000? Because with mm. these documents, you'd yeah, find absolutely. other people similarly paid. Absolutely. So given there's an average of nine people per council that we've actually looked at, that we've been able to look at. If you extrapolate that across the rest of the councils, you're probably talking about somewhere in the region of 3,600, which would make it comfortably the record. As it is, it's only the highest since 2015. But in 2015, we didn't have this problem. Most councils publish their accounts on time. But if um, you want affected people, don't mm -hmm. you have to pay the going rate? And if councils are competing with the private sector, somebody could earn 150,000 in the private sector would want to earn 150,000 working for council. I think it's a very fair point. And listen, where councils have uh, bosses that are providing services at good value for money without increasing council tax or without increasing council tax any more than is necessary, I think they have a good case for that pay packet. I think we need to remember that when we're talking about working in the public sector, it's much more than just the pay, which is already higher than in the private sector. In the public sector, you have access to a pension scheme, normally defined a benefit pension scheme, that is unavailable to almost everybody in the, in the private sector. And that seems to be where the really high figures yeah, come from. Absolutely. The figure I quoted uh, was from somebody who left the service of Hampshire yes. Council, got a year's salary, a year's 
pay off mm -hmm. and then £400,000 in pension. Yes, which is absolutely extraordinary and that's why we campaign for a cap on these uh, exit payments. And it's a reason why the public sector pension bill is now at about £2.6 trillion. These are pensions, you know, people are not paying into them. They're not going into a, a defined pot which then grows and then pays out over time. Essentially what happens is you join the council, you get put on this defined benefit scheme. When you retire you get given this guaranteed pension of not, often around 70-75% of your final earnings. It's absolutely extraordinary and I think that's one area where government can actually take some action. And if we were to do something about these very high payouts, it's actually at the pension level we need to be looking because, yeah. frankly, for senior people in senior jobs, yeah. uh, as Jeremy Hunt said recently, £100,000 is effectively the going rate. Yes. But in the private sector, nobody is getting £400,000 put into their pension. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't think we should belittle councils or pretend that they're not important. All of your viewers will know exactly how important their local council is. They provide social care, they provide education, roads, potholes, really important. They provide potholes. Ex well, I don't mean yes, to say that, they but I think they provide them. Yeah, and so they do, they, they carry enormous responsibilities, they often deal with very large budgets. These are often very important roles, but they have access to a level of additional benefits that are unheard of and, in the private sector. And some sector. of them are very good. When I was selected as the candidate mm -hmm. for North East Somerset, there was a man in Baines who was paid £300,000, mm -hmm. but he'd saved taxpayers £18 million in one year. Yeah. And um, you think that's worth it. When you can see that they're actually making contribution, but that it's this vast swathe of pensions that are a yeah. long-term liability for the country that we just can't afford and needs to be reformed. And an unfunded liability, critically. And, and again, to go back to the previous point, you know, we want good people in councils, we want good people delivering good services, but most people in the country feel their council hasn't been performing up to standards mm. recently. Though some councils are funded, it, it's, it's one of the bits of the public sector mm. where they're our payments it's, into funds. Yes, it's, it's better than areas such as the NHS and the civil service, but it, it's still a, a level of generosity that is, is not found any, almost anywhere in the private sector. And we must have a discussion at some point on the discount rates used to um, fund pensions, which is almost certainly wrong, yeah. uh, uh, and Indeed. that we're either heavily overfunded or heavily underfunded where they're, where they're funded but that the pairs you go ones are the biggest burden to the taxpayer. Yeah, absolutely. And that's how you reach these absolutely enormous figures of the 3,106 when you're looking at actually you're breaking it down by the remuneration package. The salary is a reasonable is, is a reasonable chunk, but for the most egregious cases, the 650,000, you're looking primarily mm -hmm. at pensions, pensions are the big drivers. Well, thank you very much, Elliot. Now, Abruddin. Yes, you heard correctly, Abruddin. The rebranded name given to financial institution Standard Life Aberdeen, three years ago, has provoked continued ridicule as people struggle to pronounce this alternative name for the famous Scottish city. The removal of the words vowels, undoubtedly a rather rum decision, has now been defended by the firm, which has accused the amused of corporate bullying. That includes us, I suppose. The supposed victims have taken great umbrage at the understandable laughter generated by the chain and have reiterated their confidence in Aberdeen. Though perhaps they may be right, perhaps this criticism is overdone. Who are we to pose as Puritans and judge and scorn the ever-changing developments in the English language? A Bredon may merely be ahead of its time and its enlightened decision to make the vowels go extinct may simply be a cause of natural selection in the great literary leap in Darwinian devolution, very much a case of what the Victorian naturalist might have called survival of the consonants. I think Peter Branner, the chief investment officer, or as he probably prefers, Putra Brunner, deserves to be the WTWP of the WK. Um, well, that's all from me. Up next, it's Patrick Christie's. Patrick, have you got uh, a lot of vowels coming up in your programme? I think no more than usual, Jacob, but I have thoroughly enjoyed your show. Um, look, your fellow MPs are plotting to replace Rishi Sunak. I reveal which man they want. Uh, are Rwanda now laughing at us? Uh, video footage reveals violent thugs coming across the channel. We go live to Calais, and Nigel Farage joins us live at 9.30 to reveal what Trump really thinks of David Cameron. Well, Patrick, I hope you'll tell those who are plotting just to grow up and stop plotting that we've changed Prime Minister already too many times. Uh, well, I, it's not my job to tell them to tell them that, Dude. Jacob. Maybe you should. Maybe you should. Uh, <laughs> pass on the message. <laughs> That's all coming up after the weather. I'll be back tomorrow at o'clock. I'm Jake Brees Mogg. This has been State of the Nation. And you know what the weather's going to be like in Somerset. It's going to be simply fantabulous all day. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar. Sponsors of Weather on GB News.
Hello, good evening. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update. Well, it's going to be a dry and clear night for most of us across the UK. There's a chance of frost tomorrow, but it will also be a fairly bright start. That's as this ridge of high pressure is moving in for this evening. It's a brief settled interlude between weather systems, so there will be more rain to come on Wednesday. But for the time being, it's going to be a dry night and a clear night. So plenty of starry skies, and that's going to allow temperatures to fall away much more quickly than they have done of late. So it's going to be a colder start tomorrow with, with a risk of frost across eastern areas of Scotland, northeast England as well. But everywhere is going to be on the the chillier side to start the day away from the far west where we'll see the rain move in quite quickly at tomorrow morning. So Northern Ireland seeing the heaviest rain first thing but also cloudy skies and some fairly persistent rain across parts of Wales, the southwest but it's into Scotland, western Scotland in particular where the rain will turn quite persistent through the day as well as parts of the Lake District we could see 60 millimetres of rain falling through the day but it is going to be a warmer day so that cloud and rain is bringing with it milder air that stays with us for Thursday as well. And on Thursdays, uh, there is a chance of seeing some brighter spells, particularly across northern and eastern areas of the country. Across the south, we're more likely to see some drizzly rain come and go through the day. Friday, once again, looks like it should stay dry across southern areas with more rain moving into the north and temperatures rising to the high teens. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the People's Channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Martin Daubney. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. It's 9pm, I'm Patrick Christie's Tonight...
Terror at the football, ISIS threatened to strike, plus what you're seeing on your screens now, violence on the beaches, our thugs coming across the channel, and... Yes, should we have a referendum on trans? Also... Rwanda's sold off housing for illegal migrants. Are they just taking us for a ride? Also tonight, I'm going to be talking to Nigel Farage. What does Trump really think of David Cameron? I've got all of tomorrow's newspapers today with my panel. It's Tory MP Andrew Rosendale, GB News contributor and broadcaster Albi Amancona and author Amy Nicole Turner. Oh, yes. And I wonder if you can tell what might be wrong with this woman. So I interviewed for a job earlier this week. The interview went so well. Every question she had, I had a great answer for. I used to work in recruitment. I, I know how to interview. Get ready, Britain. Here we go. The Rwandans are laughing at us. Next. The news at just after nine o'clock. My name's Polly Middlehurst. Our top story tonight, Arsenal FC is hosting Bayern Munich at the Emirates Stadium tonight, despite a terror threat from the Islamic State group. Manchester City are also in action. They're away to Real Madrid. The Metropolitan Police says it's put into place tonight a robust policing plan for the